And um, I was very fortunate to come up upon um, Romeo Rim and the team there has been doing some amazing things. They're a B2B company and they'll tell you a little bit more about themselves, but they do some amazing things in order to generate leads. Um, and I thought in this, in this world of where we are, where we can't visit anyone, they've got some great ideas. So I hope you'll all take something from it. But as you know, if you've joined me before, we're gonna go through a few slides at first and let the stragglers who haven't quite gotten into Zoom get there. Um, so next slide, whoops, sorry. Um, so who are we? Well, I'm glad you've joined us. This is ISBM. We were founded in 1982 um, at Penn State as a collection of academics that were studying B2B marketing, as well as significant companies that were interested in advancing the knowledge of B2B marketing. Today, we're about 40 member firms that learn from each other, and we have 29 academic fellows, those are named fellows for ISBM that support us, um, 18 B2B instructors and a whole lot of partner organizations that support our member companies. And of course, we'd love for you to join us if you're not already a member. And if you'd like to learn more, you can see us at isbm.com. Today, we're gonna to have Brian Graves. He's on the left and he's marketing coordinator at Romeo Rim and he'll tell you a little bit more about himself as I uh, hand this over to him. And I'm Lynn Yanyu, I'm the executive director of ISBM. So how do we work together with this? So if you've used Zoom over the last year, then you're probably familiar with this. And if not, let me just tell you that at the bottom, you should see a toolbar. And in that toolbar, you'll see a couple of things. There's a Q and A tab. If you click on that, you'll be able to type in your question. We'd love for you to type in your question as you think of it, whenever you think of it. And I'm gonna hold the questions and field those for, for Brian at the end of the presentation. So just type them in as you think of them and then I'll share them with him. If you're having problems and difficulties with the system, you can also type that in the Q&A bar and Lori and I will figure out how to fix that for you. You can also go to chat, which is under the more dot, dot, dot thing. You can pull up chat and talk to us in the chat window. And Lori and I will be monitoring that all through the presentation. Um, during this webinar, you've, you're automatically muted and uh, video is uh, turned off, just gives us more bandwidth. And um, so you'll pay attention, I'm sorry, to, to Brian. Um, but again, at the end, we'll have uh, a dialogue and question and answer. So thanks. And there's always the question of how do I see this later? Because I have friends that really wanted to see this or I got distracted during the middle of this presentation. In any case, we record all of our webinars and you'll find any of them within 30 days of their presentation right there at the top of our uh, uh, activity site on isbm.com. After 30 days, you can get access to that through B2B Pulse, through the member login. And if you're not a member, that would be a great time to reach out and contact one of us and we can help you with that. So all of our past historical presentations, um, research and other things are all in our library in, in B2B Pulse. But for the next 30 days, even if you're not a member, you can feel free to find this presentation and share it from our site uh, at isbm.com. And who are we? So um, I'm Lynn Yanyo. Rand Mendez is my partner um, and other executive trucker and Becky Williams manages our curriculum. We've also been recently uh, joined by Scott Israelson, formerly from ExxonMobil most recently, and now he's gonna be helping us with our membership support. Um, on the academic side, Stefan is the director and uh, uh, directs the research component of um, ISBM at Penn State. Lori actually does all of the work for all of us. Um, Ralph Oliva is my past predecessor and um, is still active with us and supports us. And Gary Lillian is Stefan's past predecessor, um, also still supporting us. And I'm hoping to twist his arm for our next member meeting. If he's on, this is my way of asking. We also have a, a wide um, uh, creation of list of fellows. This is kind of all of the academic uh, entities that they come from and just a few um, uh, images of some of the ones we have. Um, these folks are premier in their field. They teach for us, they consult for us, and they keep us um, apprised of the latest developments. And it is why ISBM is the leader in academic research in B2B marketing. Here are some of our member firms, just as a peek. Um, and then uh, just a heads up on what's coming. So if you haven't been to the isbm.com site, but you must have because you registered for this, um, you can see that there's a few more things coming up. We have started a quarterly event. The first one is March 9th. If you're a new member or if you're um, an employee, 
of a member company, but you've never been involved with ISBM before and you just want to know what the heck it is that you can get out of this membership, I hope you'll join me on March 9th where I will give a short overview of all of the different things that you can do with your membership and things you can look for and uh, hopefully achieve for your company. And I'll take questions, any and all. So please join us March 9th to learn more about your membership. March 17th, you won't want to miss it all. George Day will be with us. He's one of our ISBM fellows. He's recently completed a book called, called um, Seeing Sooner, uh, Acting Faster. Um, it's about vigilance and it's about paying attention to weak signals in the marketplace and making sure your company is prepared with agility to be able to address those. Boy, if there was ever a time we needed that book last year, that was last year. Um, and so he will be headlining that, taking questions and uh, talking to us about that specifically. And then May 18th and 19th, please sign up for that in advance. Um, we're doing a joint meeting with SEI, which is the Sales Excellence Institute at the University of Houston. Houston. It's kind of a sister organization to us. They do B2B sales and we do B2B marketing. Um, and we're going to be talking about how things are transformed now after all of our experiences in the last year with COVID and how marketing and sales is going to be acting differently and maybe performing better. And then lastly, I'll point you to our ISBM B2B mastery track. So we have just created an eight month elapsed time uh, training program. It's really seven segments spread out over a long period of time so that you can find a way to fit it into your calendar because you're going to keep working and hopefully work on your projects while you learn the end-to-end -end efforts that you need in order to be a good B2B marketer. Uh, you can see all of the details on our website, uh, isbm.com slash curriculum. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. You can also sign up for any of the segments individually but if you're new to marketing or if you're a trainer of people in your marketing organization, this is the way to get everything you need in one relatively short period of time. And then lastly, I'll remember again that you can go to B2B Pulse to find anything that we have. Everything we have there has been recorded. Okay, so again, um, feel free to reach out to me, Rand, now Scott and Becky, um, and there's Brian's email address, which we'll show you again later, um, if you wanna follow up and ask him any questions or offer anything. And then uh, what I'm gonna do is stop sharing now and uh, turn it over to Brian. Brian um, has been working for the last couple of years, maybe three years um, on um, ways to really drive people to find their company. So I'm mean, well, I'm just going to stop talking there because I don't want to actually <laughs> feel the thunder. Now let me stop sharing. Here it comes. Right, okay, can, great. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Hear you, Brian. Thank you. Okay. So I'll just go ahead and share. Um, great. Okay, everything's good. Yep, I'm going to okay. go quiet. Okay, so. Um, my name is Brian Graves. Uh, I've been working with Romeo Rim for the last three or so years. Um, and previous to that, uh, I've done, I've worn a lot of hats. I've kind of can consider myself a one man marketing team. Um, I've done a lot of um, content creation over all different types of media. Um, and so this is what you're going to be seeing a little bit of today is uh, some of the content that I've produced. Uh, and then I'll be going over uh, some of those results. Um, but first, uh, I just want to ask you a quick question and just kind of throw it out there and see how often do you create or publish content, whether it be to publish it to your website, uh, social media, or, or what. Um, so I'll give you a couple of seconds to answer that. Um, we have the poll open. If you just click on the appropriate one, it'll mark it for you. And then um, after we've seen, and Laura, you can watch for how many are coming. I can't see that. Um, give it a second or two. All right, Lori. So, okay. Um, and it looks like, uh, so basically what I'm gonna say is that, you know, if you're not choosing A, then uh, I'm gonna show you why choosing A is the right answer. Okay. So uh, I've committed myself to posting uh, once per day through Romeo Rim's uh, corporate account. Um, and it kind of helps drive the whole content creation stuff. And again, I'll show you the results of that. So um, my background, uh, again, uh, been with Romeo Rim for three years, um, worn a lot of hats, uh, 
consider myself a full stack marketer. Uh, I've dabbled in web creation, graphics, um, written word, articles, things like that. I've done a lot of a video, some animations and, and that sort of thing. So um, kind of just, I love creating content really. So uh, as I go through this, uh, I'm gonna, I, I gotta give you a little bit of background as to who Romeo Rim is. Uh, that's going to put a lot of context to the content I'm going to I'm going to be showing you uh, a little bit behind the, the marketing history of Romeo Rim just to kind of give you that frame of reference, um, uh, tell you about the initiative that we began and kind of how we go to market with that with that initiative through a process called social selling. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Um, and then I'm going to go through we're going to cover a lot of uh, the various content that I've produced. Um, and again, um, I will show you the results, the, the actual business impact of some of these, uh, of this, of this consistently publishing content. So then we'll uh, follow up with some questions if you have any. So we'll get started. Um, who is Romeo Rim? Now, uh, this is our manufacturing headquarters uh, and it's located in Romeo, Michigan. Um, and you might be wondering if you didn't notice the logo at the beginning, what rim stands for. And I'll tell you, it does not stand for wheel rims. Um, we actually don't do wet rims. And I say that because we actually get quite a few calls uh, from local people asking if we do rims. Um, sadly, no. Um, we actually are a reaction injection molding company. Um, and we did a little bit of a rebrand uh, not long before I came on board. And we included with that, the actual reaction injection molding at the bottom, just to kind of reinforce that logo. So reaction injection molding, but what is that really? It's, we take a process where we bring a, what they call a matrix material and a, um, a fiber material. We put them together in a mold and we create parts, okay? Uh, they're called, they're composite parts, okay? And we actually take CAD data from our customers, uh, it's their design, uh, and we help them um, produce the parts that they need. And so you're probably, well, what type of parts what are we talking about here? Um, these are the type of parts that would uh, be on the large scale. Um, they require custom tooling um, because you can imagine a part as large as 10 feet by 10 feet would require a tool that is uh, actually a little bit bigger than that. So um, and in most cases, these tools are um, produced in either aluminum or steel, uh, and they need to be carved out of that block, uh, which it gets very expensive. Um, so we have a very high uh, initial cost. Um, our parts um, are mostly beneficial within the low to mid volume range. That's a thousand to 25 units per year. Uh, and this chart will kind of give you the competitive landscape of where we fall in the other materials that we uh, compete against. And a lot of these materials are, um, have already been established for many years. We're a little bit new to the market in terms of these types of materials that we're processing. Um, and you'll see here, long fiber, in, uh, long fiber injection, is one of the process we're like the only north we're the only um, material processor in North America that does long fiber injection. Um, so there's a lot of there's a need to educate um, these engineers on these other materials that they can that are available to them. And I guess the biggest thing I wanted to point out to is that is the sales cycle. Um, so we have very very large uh, long sales cycles, um, so six to eighteen months, and even and even longer in some cases. Um, and so what that means is, is that a lead that I get today will not be actualized for a minimum six to say 18 months. Um, in other words, we're not, we're working with them, um, but we're not getting any sort of revenue from that lead until we finalize the deal uh, and get that, uh, those, that CAD data. So to vet the actual project itself to make sure that we can do it. So uh, long sales cycles. Um, what are the types of products that we actually produce? So we will create hoods, roofs, and fenders for the agricultural market in the, in the form of tractors. And so um, you'll find, you know, these nice uh, panelings and, and hoods and roofs and all that stuff that make tractors look nice. 
Um, we make uh, actually bumpers for the mass transit in industry. Um, any, there's a good chance that if you've, you know, seen a mass transit bus, it, bus, it has our bumper on it. Um, we would make uh, paneling for uh, things like a forklift. In many cases, these side panelings here you can see here are made of steel and a composite uh, material is a, a very suitable uh, replacement for uh, heavy steel. Um, we would also be found on these class eight trucks. These, this is what's called an air deflector. And this, this part is actually very, very large. I'll show you that in a, in a little bit. Um, and it's molded as one piece. Um, and speaking of one piece, we actually uh, get some business through a park consolidation in the form of these spas. So uh, in many cases, uh, these spas are separate panels that have to be uh, um, many, or I'm sorry, assembled on site. And so what we do is we make these parts that are just that big, they, they, they can just put them in as one, as one part itself. So um, then once we, you understand where the, what our products are. Um, our customers are uh, people like design engineers, product engineers, product managers, um, even supply chain managers. And so we deal with a lot of uh, very large OEMs, multi-billion dollar OEMs that produce things like tractors. And so in many cases, these projects are actually um, formed with teams. And so in many cases we work with uh, teams of people so it could be any one of these uh types of people that we're that we're that we're speaking to and um you know targeting as our as our customer um and so to kind of frame where we're i'm going to go with this uh you have to understand a little bit of the history so we're a manufacturer was um it was uh, been around since 1982 very little outbound to or inbound marketing um and in fact uh one thing i want to uh, point out here is that most of our new leads uh, prior to say 2017 uh, had come from existing customers. So that was our main uh, source of business growth is from existing customers. And so uh, we had this outdated website and this is a screenshot of it from I believe 2016. And so, uh, I mean, not great. Um, there was really no social media presence and the leads that we did come, that we did get from existing customers uh, came to the tune of one to two leads per month. I'm actually told that that's generous. So um, just not a whole, whole lot of uh, uh, marketing and, and, and prospecting going on. Uh, and then in 2017, Romy Rim decided to um, do this marketing thing, right? So, um, and with that, they uh, created a new website. So we went from uh, a website that looked like this to something that looks a little bit more like this as it is today. And in fact, um, I'm waiting to relaunch a new site that I just put together. Uh, and this is kind of a, a snapshot of that. But um, so that's kind of where we're going in terms of uh, web presence. Um, and then they established some training on social selling as a way to get uh, some of the sales managers to um, uh, deliberate um, prospecting um, and highly targeted. So. Uh, and with that, uh, we were able to establish a social media presence, okay? Um, so this all started in 2017-ish. I was brought on board, I think, um, in 20, late 2017. And so things really didn't get started until uh, the latter half of 2018-ish. Uh, of so um the social selling aspect is just again a deliberate attempt to um target these customers um and it's all driven with uh with basically the, the content creation so with the content we're our aim is to provide value uh, to engage in those conversations um but we need to find out who they are and where they are so what we would do is we would take an art market like agriculture and we would literally list all the different applications uh, within agriculture tractors balers sprayers and that sort of thing. And we would um, go through and find pictures of these and find applications that would actually fit for us. Um, and in this case, uh, this roof is, a, is, a, is kind of a flat panel that we thought was, would fit our LFI process. So um, we would look up the, the, the customers themselves or the, the company themselves, say John Deere, there's CNH um, and those sorts of 
large companies and we would find the design engineer, product managers, and whoever within uh, within those. And those would be our target customers. So all driven by content creation though. So now we're gonna get into the, the actual kind of the show and tell of how I um, was put together uh, this content, right? So um, because we deal with a lot of engineers, um, one of the things that we want to do is educate them and to educate them, we need to convert this these technical engineering concepts it's to a little bit more easy to understand language. And so much of my content centers around that. Um, and so, and of course we want to provide value. Um, we are a uh, manufacturer of custom parts using uh, materials that they may or may not be aware of. And so education becomes a, um, something that we definitely want them to understand. Uh, that there's uh, other products out in the market other than the more standardized materials that they're used to. And so, of course, that will help them solve problems. They're engineers. Engineers love to solve problems. Uh, and so my content comes from all of these things to educate, entertain, and to ultimately engage. Okay, and there's some, some, um, some entertaining stuff in here, which I, I hope you'll like. So and with that, I'll get into uh, really the, uh, well, and then once the content is created, of course, we would uh, post on our website. Um, we have email campaigns that goes out and we would also, uh, uh, social media allows me to take um, snippets of that and repurpose content. So um, a, a lot of what you'll find is um, me sticking to that one day per week. And I'm talking business days, actually, Monday through Friday, that one day per post um, um, per week. Um, you'll find that it's a lot of repurposed content. So, um, so the first example I wanted to show you is this uh, is this piece, which um, is one of our more popular pieces in the sense that this is uh, many thousands of views. And one of the things, the fundamental difference between uh, what we do and say uh, some of the other people do is that we work in thermal set plastics, um, and then there's this what's called thermoplastic, okay? And there's a, there's a fundamental difference between a thermoset and thermoplastic, which I will play for you. And in under 30 seconds, you too will understand the difference as we uh, watch this flame go underneath this, uh, a sample of thermoset and a sample of thermoplastic. So uh, this was posted on social media. You see this, this is kind of the snapshot of that there. Uh, and voila. You now understand the difference between thermoset and thermoplastic in under 30 seconds. Thermoplastic melts, thermosets do not. Okay, simple piece of uh, piece of content. Um, I actually working with um, I work with such a great team at Romeo Rim that I can if I have an idea I can get up out of my chair I can walk over to one of the engineers and say Hey I got this idea let's let's do this and so this video was actually a kind of a product of that. We, I said, hey, let's let's show the difference between this. And he said, okay, let's go. So we uh, I, we took less than 20, 25 minutes. We set this all thing up. It's real, all ad hoc, just on the fly. Uh, I used my phone to, to videotape this. I put them into the video editor, put them side by side. And this is what you had about uh, two hours later from the moment I said, hey, let's do this. So um, it, it, you'll see that's kind of how my content creation goes. <laughs> and um, there's some, um, the pandemic kind of put a damper on that a bit, but um, another piece of really simple educational content I was able to uh, put together is, uh, it's funny uh, that working with engineers, I was, I was writing this copy and I think I used the term bigger at some point. And he was looking at this copy and he looked at me and said, well, well what do you mean bigger? What, what does bigger mean? You know, it, it doesn't mean anything. There's no frame of reference, bigger than what, right? So, so we make these claims, bigger, stronger, lighter. Well, here's a example of just a real quick example of what bigger actually means. And this was a 15 second video of us really demolding a part. Um, so you can get a sense of that size. And this is actually that air deflector that goes on top of that class eight truck. So um, the, one, the one thing I'd love, I'd, want to note is that um, my job as a, a marketer towards you know and the engineering type um, it helps immensely when you work with engineers <laughs> so um, it's really good to have that as a resource 
Um, so a lot of our uh, materials obviously are competing against, like as I said, uh, more standardized uh, materials in the in the market. And so one of the things that we really need to uh, show here is this materials impact resistance because that's really important to, uh, you know, for I mean, you can imagine being in a tractor and you know the dust is flying, maybe there's rocks flying and debris, and so they got to be highly impact resistant. Maybe you run into something, and so this is basically uh, we had some uh, spare part uh, laying around. I think it was it might have been even a defect. Um, and so we just, I <laughs> took a hammer and started bashing it again. This is one of these ideas where I just like, let's, let's start bashing parts. And so I got an engineer to help me. Uh, and the only, the only, uh, problem with this video is that this is the, this is the biggest hammer we could find. I wanted a sledgehammer. We could not find one. So we had this little hammer. So I just tried to hit it as hard as I could. Um, and so you'll see the result of that, that, the it kind of pans over and you see the impact resistance, there's no dents. So um, quick video for that. Uh, another one of the um, um, aspects of the material, the same material, it's actually the same part um, in a different color, um, is its flexibility. And if this will load, all right, it's got it here too. So there's me just showing the, the flex of the part, you know, um, It'll bounce back if, after you hit it. It's not only impact resistant, but it'll bounce back. So quick 10 second video there. Uh, again, to educate our customers. Um, let's go back. That's not supposed to happen. There we go. So here is some educational content I produced. Again, with the with the we're competing against, you know, these standard, more standardized long established materials. So one of the things that I wanted to do is let's make sure that these engineers and project managers are able to see the materials side by side. So I actually built this as an app. Um, and what you're able to do here is you pull down the one process on this side, you pull down the process on this side, and you can actually go through and understand the, the actual differences side by side as you go through these different um, aspects of the, of the products themselves. And a little leave behind, they're able to download that kind of sums everything up. In fact, this was what I produced before. I, this is basically a digitized version of this. So, um, and then they're free to download that as a PDF. Um, this one, a little bit more involved. Um, I do dabble a bit in uh, PHP, HTML, CSS, in some cases, MySQL. Um, but some of it's a little bit of, above my head, but that doesn't stop me from trying. So what I wanted to do was put together all of these materials in one place so that they could enter information on their project, on their specific project. And this will actually spit out a uh, basically a short list of suitable materials based on you know uh, these criteria so what's the maximum temperature requirement okay so you enter that your part size how much you're going to do an annual volume how stiff you need it to be and how important lightweight is so it's going to take all five of these factors rank them uh, accordingly and spit out these these results so uh, the closest to 100 percent are the materials that are more suitable and this is just for temperature uh, but we'll skip all that and go right to the final results and you get this uh, cumulative graph which uh, is showing based on these um, factors you entered um, this polyurethane reaction injection molding as well as this DCPD would be a suitable fit based on these criteria so another piece of concept that um, I will admit I think um, our vice president of business development is on here today um, and I don't know, I'm pretty sure I shared this, but uh, when I proposed I could do this, I wasn't quite sure I could do it, but <laughs> it worked out and it worked. So, um, so there was that. Um, another idea where I actually, in, in this case, um, I grabbed uh, engineer, this is a uh, James, James Hotel. Um, and I was able to pull him and uh, get about an hour of his time to film 
this uh, impact test, uh, which I, I, as you can see, I called it an impactometer because <laughs> I'm a marketing guy, right? And that's what you do. Uh, but no, it's actually called an impact tester, which is, I know, how boring is that? So, uh, so this is a bigger three minute video that we actually broke down into snippets of just this actual, you know, 17 second clip of him dropping this, I think it's a 20 pound weight onto this needle and pin where it punches holes through things. And so this is a competitive material that I, I, I believe this is fiberglass reinforced plastic, which uh, penetrates. Um, so more education uh, and that sort of thing. Um, here's a piece of content. Again, educational. Um, I happen to find myself, it's, it's funny how these ideas just come to you. Uh, I found myself walking around Cedar Point one day and Cedar Point is an amusement park in um, Sandusky, Ohio. And so uh, a lot of people from Michigan go, Michigan go there. Um, so I'm walking by and I see this, um, this generator uh, encased in steel. And of course it's kind of rusty. It's not looking great. And I'm wondering, you know, would you really want your logo slapped on that. So I took a picture of it and realized that when I got back, I was going to do some Photoshop work and make it look like what it could look like if you used composites. Um, and so I did this Photoshop work and uh, made it look uh, nicer. So, and just did the juxtaposition here. Uh, I even went so far as to um, design in these kind of aesthetics uh, to make it look a little bit more appealing just as a way to show what else you can do with composites instead of this plain sheet steel. Um, so that went well. Um, again, my team at Romeo Rim, especially uh, Matt Getty, uh, my boss, uh, fantastic people to work with. Uh, we were able to put together a, some webinars. Um, you can see this is an introduction to long fiber injection and introduction to dicyclopentanine. That, now that's a mouthful. You can, all, you can, you can say DCPD. Um, but uh, so Many of these material and product engineers don't know that these materials are available to them. So uh, we created these webinars called Introductions because we wanted to introduce these materials um, in a way that we can show them and explain to them what uh, they'd be getting uh, out of it. So these ran about 30 minutes each. Um, I leaned heavily on uh, on our um, you know, every, every person in the department that I work in, the business development department, has an engineering background. So leaning heavily on all of their experience and their knowledge uh, is, is, is so fantastic that, you know, we were able to publish these webinars pretty, pretty easily. Um, and this kind of led me to uh, thinking about um, that repurposing of, of some of this content. So, um, and this will also give me a chance to kind of show you a bit of how I was able to actually get to one post per day. So I was going through these webinars and these are actually recent. And so this is an Excel document I uh, keep that I, um, that I plan for at least a week or two ahead of time. And so every week or two, I put together this plan. I create the content that I'm gonna use. And I happened upon the one webinar that I'd forgotten about, um, and it was a it was a um, a clip where the engineer said something just really funny, and you can actually hear me laughing on this video where he says, you know, he's trying to he's trying to tell you where you're going to find this material, this solid elastic material, and he says, well, you see this recurring theme here of locations where you might run into stuff, and so that was that was hilarious to me. So. Uh, or where things might bump into it. And so I took that and sort of created a theme from Monday to Friday, and I kind of do that a lot, where uh, this was the introduction. And so I, I kind of introduced the fact that the, these next week, uh, we're going to show you examples of locations where you may run into stuff. And so I would start out each post that day, uh, you know, here's one location where you might run into stuff and give you a snippet of the actual webinar. It's maybe a 20 second clip. And that 
we covered three of them in this webinar, so I had three examples to show, spread it out over these three days, and then ended with another um, material uh, post. So just give you a little bit of insight of how I'm able to produce uh, once a day, if that helps. Um, this led to a uh, an email campaign where uh, basically I used those webinars that were uh, pre-recorded uh, much like this one is, um, and allows our uh, customers to view them uh, whenever they wanted, you know, as a, and I kind of framed it as, you know, consider these as extra tools for your toolbox, because they really are. Um, I'm not so much selling as I am kind of, you know, here's, here's a, here's another tool for your toolbox. Um, <clears throat> this one was fun. We have this, uh, what we call a rotary press. And in the, this rotary press is about the size of a hockey rink. It's about the same shape. Uh, and on it are up to seven carriers. And these carriers hold a mold that opens and closes. And I'll start this video here so you can kind of get a better idea. And so, um, and so they, they go around the track and then the, tr and the, the mold goes to the station it needs to be at. Uh, and then it closes eventually, and it goes around the track to cure. And then once it's done, it opens up, and then the part gets demolded, and the process starts over again. So um, really interesting to see. It's it's the only one like it in North America, as I know. Uh, and it's just an interesting process. So I was able to get in there, and uh, I actually attached a GoPro <laughs> to the side of this. And this happened to be the test run. Um, I had full intentions of doing a different version of this, um, but uh, this one ended up being um, sufficient. And um, more importantly, there was no damage to the camera. So we had a, the reason why there's kind of this hazy glow on there is because there's a plastic bag over the camera to protect it. So, um, and then, you know, more really simple educational videos, the mold will close. And then when it opens, the part is there. So less than a minute, you understand uh, that process. Um, a quick five second animation that, uh, you know, I referred to as those, um, the, the spa paneling. Well, in one case, we were able to reduce all of these parts into one large part. And this is just a real simple animation to kind of show that. So it all comes out in one piece and then you apply it as one. So real quick and simple. Um, okay, so this, was interesting and because I mentioned I you know usually would just get up out of my chair, uh, run over the nearest engineer and you know hey I have an idea. Well, the pandemic kind of put a damper on that as I mentioned, and so a lot of the time so I've been working from home, and the problem with that is that we have uh, in our uh, main office a uh, customer experience area where we actually have physical parts in a large open area where they can look at and we can talk about, and there's little plaques that kind of gives it, gives some specs. And so um, that was, and because of our long sales cycles, uh, we, we generally tend to uh, like to establish these relationships with these people. And because some of this, you know, business ends up carrying on for years. Um, and so when we are kind of, I guess, courting, a customer, we, we, we invite them into our customer experience area to, to kind of show what we do and we, we, and we give plant tours. Well, <clears throat> a lot of that came to an end. So we put together a, a basically a virtual tour, again, with the help of Meg Getty, thank you. Uh, we went around and went, hit to all the major spots we normally would have gone to on, a, on an actual tour. And we just filmed uh, Matt Getty actually doing that tour. Um, and it was fantastic. I, I broke it up into parts. Um, so I think there's a total of 16 videos. Yep, 16 videos in there. And so instead of, you know, relying on people coming to us to see, uh, we can actually, you know, create that video for them to see at home. So um, that was really, that was actually fun. Um, and you'll notice uh, here, I just want to kind of make a point that um, a lot of my videos are captioned. 
Um, and I think that's important, especially when it comes to posting on social media. I know I do it. I, when I'm flipping through my social media, I, um, uh, I'm doing it with the, with the audio off. And so captioning, captioning becomes really important to, to still be able to grab the attention of your, uh, of your viewer. Um, and so this is, so do you remember how I said we're trying to take technical jargon and put it in an easy to understand language? Well, this was, this was an attempt on my part to kind of, I pushed that envelope a little bit. And so <clears throat> if you really think about uh, our LFI process, you saw that rodeo press, ro rotary press go around and it had some stuff sprayed into it. And then at the end, it had this kind of slurry, you know, splashed into it and the mold closed and then it opened up. Well, what did that, what does that actually look like? Well, it looks an awful lot like making waffles. So uh, I actually made this post here, here that is, uh, and I kind of offered them up, uh, you know, what uh, the question, what could you make with an industrial size waffle maker? So <clears throat> it was interesting. I did get some, um, some funny feedback about that. Uh, so uh, it, it just kind of puts it in term in, in, in every, in everyday non-engineering terms. Um, the final piece of this these ed, this educational content i'll cover a little bit more uh and then we'll get into some fun stuff and then results so still got a little bit of time so uh again pushing the uh, envelope of turning technical jargon into easy to understand language and so we have a process we use um again referring back to that, that video of the rotary you saw those those things being sprayed into it well one of those things being sprayed into it is actual paint and so what we're able to do is normally when you produce a composite part, um, they require post painting. Uh, and so you demold the part, you have to trim it, you have to sand the part to make sure uh, to sure proper paint adhesion. Uh, and you're going to get, um, it's, it's a very labor intensive, um, cost intensive. And so we use in mold paint. And so in my attempt to explain that to people, I came up with this. It's the composite version of pulling a cake out of the oven with the frosting already on. So um, <laughs> we'll see how this goes. I have this scheduled for next week. Um, but uh, um, I should mention, you know, you're welcome to follow Romeo Rim, which is where I'm posting all of these. And I do continually the post once per day. Uh, some of them are fun. Some of them are not. <laughs> some of them are just entertaining. And we'll start getting into a little bit of some of the other stuff I produce in terms of uh, getting it out to our customer is, and of course, awards. And we're big into those relationships and as well as accomplishments. And uh, again, that sales cycle requires us to really, um, you know, build those relationships with those customers because they could last years. Uh, and so we celebrate that with, uh, <clears throat> by talking about, you know, supplier performance award. And we've won this award, I think, the last five years in a row. Um, and so we celebrate that. So those are easy pieces of content that help fulfill, you know, those that posting ones per day. Um, other type of content that I will, I will get into is sometimes news um, and, you know, the whole SpaceX Falcon Heavy launches have been incredible to watch. I don't know if any of you've seen those videos, but uh, in fact, one of them looked like the two rockets returning to earth uh looked like a a video game to me and uh it was it was pretty amazing to see so um so what i'll try to relate to some kind of engineering e type stuff you know that uh that i would think an engineer might, might might be interested in so kind of to relate to them um it's always great to also talk about your employees. Um, Romeo Room has a very, very good company culture. Um, we celebrate our employees uh, through uh, service awards. Every quarter, we um, we talk about you know how many years of service uh, someone might have. Um, we actually hold food drives for local businesses uh, to you know local food banks, um, and so we post a lot actually about employees and our in our in kind of our our charity work almost so um which i think it's great to celebrate um you also notice i hope maybe that uh i don't i try to avoid stock photography as much as possible uh in fact i don't i don't think i've used 
any of it yet. Um, so these photos, like this photo here, this is an actual photo I took. Um, someone else took this, obviously, so I'm in it. Um, but um, so everything that you'll see uh, is, in terms of photography wise, is probably shot with my phone. <laughs> um, and because we use um, social media as a supplement to, as a, as a recruiting tool, um, we talk about employees in the sense that, you know, it's a great place to work. Uh, and so these two individuals, we, I sat down, interviewed them, um, and was able to put these videos together and basically them talking about their rise in, you know, the rankings of our, of our business. And, uh, and I think that's really great to see, uh, especially if you're trying to, you know, um, encourage people to get a job with you. So. Now we get into the kind of fun stuff. Um, and there's a couple examples of these. Uh, and this one's one of my favorites. Um, and I don't know if you've, well, there's captions here, so you won't really need to hear the sound, but I don't, do you remember when I told you that we get a lot of calls about doing wheel rims? Well, we had fun with that. So I'll let you, I'll just let this play. Um, there's sound, but you won't need it. It's captioned. And there he is pulling his rim up. Oh, they don't do rims. But his Romeo rim. And no, we don't do hubcaps. So uh, this is actually a uh, um, cut down version. I actually intended on making this into a movie, <laughs> uh, but it only lasted like a minute and a half and it ended up being too long to get to the point. So uh, real quick uh, video on that. Which I thought was fun. We got a we got a lot of uh, a lot of feedback on that. Um, so we make large parts, uh, and you've seen that air deflector, and so we had fun with that too. And so we were able to pull some people from the shop floor, from the front office, and this was last year. We had a snow day. There's there happened to be a kind of a small hill uh, behind our facility, uh, and so we. You know, in an hour or so, we we're able to fill this whole thing, put it in the editing, and create these graphics. And now you have this kind of fun video where we're showcasing the product while, you know, pointing out all of its, uh, you know, capabilities and attributes. So, uh, Ken, kudos to the Romeo Rim team for allowing me to be able to do this. Uh, this is not something I think you typically see out of a B two B company, but uh, I think it adds personality and. and uh, I, and, and I'm actually going to show you that uh, in, a, in a bit. Uh, final, uh, this is this happens to be Lynn's favorite one, and one of mine also. And the backstory before I show you, um, and so engineering people are so great to work with. And uh, I was walking past one of the engineers' desks, and I see this, and I. I kid you not, I, I LOL'd, I laughed out loud uh, for probably longer than I should have, uh, but it was so funny to me. This is actually a recreation, and if you laugh, you might be an engineer. So <laughs> someone came by, grabbed one of the engineer's glue, and another engineer came by, crossed off the glue, and wrote adhesive because it's more descriptive, because glue is not glue, it's an adhesive, and, and so it's this engineering term that he came out and corrected it and it was funny. So I, I literally posted this and uh, we got quite a bit of uh, good feedback on that as well. So um, final piece that I'm going to share with you today and I'm just gonna let this run. Um, so this is our business development team. And what I wanted to do here was to uh, introduce the entire team to prospective customers uh, in a fun way uh, and so this is what we came up with. Um, so you have this, you know, all of us walking out slow motion style, kind of epic, uh, you know, introducing everybody in the team because in the business development um, department, uh, if you as a customer uh, decide to reach out to us uh, via email, phone or whatnot, there is a 99% chance you will get one of us. So uh, this is a way to, um, kind of put the face to the name 
you know, so in kind of a fun way. We had a lot of really good feedback on this one as well. Uh, and so that concludes the examples of the content I was going to show you. Now we'll get into the results, which are equally important. And there's me. So anyway, enough of that. Uh, so on LinkedIn alone, which is where I concentrated most of my uh, um, content efforts and publishing, uh, we gained over 480 followers, purely organic, uh, over a, a year and a half, two-year period. Uh, you can see kind of this chart that shows that. We average about 20 per month of new followers. And we also had an engagement of about 5.5% uh, on average, so um, which I think is not bad. Uh, but more importantly, uh, the impressions, um, over 7,500 uh, impressions per month. Um, and that's a lot of people viewing your content. Um, and it's a lot of touch points. Um, and so even better, um, web traffic. So of course, all of the, all of, you know, these things were published to our website, which uh, enhanced our SEO. Uh, and so you'll see this great graph. If you ever go check out SEM Rush, I, I, I do this like once a month just to look at this graph because it's so fantastic. Um, but you can see here our kind of SEO efforts started late 2017. And then by January, 2018, we started moving that needle up a little bit. And so I, I was on board right around, right before this. And so you can see this fantastic graph and, and web traffic that goes all the way up to about 10, 10.5K per month, uh, which is about where we're at now. So uh, in the course of uh, two years, so not bad. Um, this also impacted our organic keywords and search traffic, especially relative to the, to the competition with all this content we were able to create. Uh, you can see uh, here's a, a, a listing of what SEM Rush considers to be our uh, competition, and here's us. So we're getting found a lot more through way more keywords uh, and way more traffic. So um, outpacing them. Um, another key business impact is the leads per month. So I mentioned before uh, the existing customers were contributing to about one to two leads per month. Well, we went from before 2018, one to two, to after 2019 to about 10 to 15. You can see this is my actual screenshot of my actual scorecard uh, that these double digit leads that had come in every month, well, just about. So and it continues to this day. Here's another shot of that. Uh, but in, in, in this case, it's going from right to left. And so the biggest thing I wanted to point out here is that uh, actually last month we had our highest ever number of leads. So uh, that was pretty fantastic. And look like we got about seven or so minutes. I'm almost through. Opportunities by lead source. Uh, so you'll see uh, these are the what we consider the marketing uh, lead sources, a website, email, and inbound. And so over the course of two years, this is since 20, uh, I believe 2018, uh, we've gotten 122 uh, website leads, 38, 16, a total of 176 new opportunities that we normally wouldn't have gotten had we not had a uh, marketing program. So uh, the other thing I wanted to point out here is this, this key here. Uh, again, existing customers was our number one um, um, lead source, but now two years later, it's now become the website. So, uh, and this is also reflected in the dollars. Um, we have $81 million worth of opportunities via website for a total of $107 million in opportunities since 2018. Now, again, I, I want to, that's why I wanted to stress the uh, long sales cycle. So these are opportunities that we're still working. Um, and they're still in the pipeline. So, and in many cases, um, there's a, we have a very, very good high probability of landing those. So, but uh, just to give you a bottom dollar sense of what's this produced so far, um, 176 marketing leads, which led to, like I said, $107 million in opportunities and actual dollar amount has led to three and a half million dollars in book business. So um, again, I wanted this, I mean, that's, that is the absolute lowest. And these are, the, this is actually um, business that we're getting, um, you know, money flow with. So uh, that's not the, this can only go higher. 
um, because of these opportunities that are in this funnel still. Um, what does that cost in terms of return on investment? Well, uh, you get someone like me, uh, maybe uh, someone else to help out with content creation. Maybe you outsource it to a, uh, to a marketing agency or whatnot, um, but estimation, uh, I'm, I'm guessing 70 to 150,000 uh, a year. Um, and uh, with a software on the computer, um, so we'll give that a conservative estimate say of you know $100,000 um, over the course of two years, which equated in this case, three and a half million in book business. And so the revenue per dollar spent is $17 and 50 cents. And that of course, based solely on this three and a half million calculation can only get higher uh, with that $107 million in uh, opportunities in the funnel. Um, of that 65 million are from a customer, I'd like to point out uh, that we wouldn't normally have considered being a target. They actually found us uh, through our website and content uh, and reached out to us. And we're actually uh, have a very, very good high probability of landing a new $65 million project. So uh, the other biggest takeaway from this is those videos that I produced, putting the face to the names. Uh, this, is the, this is the quote that I think that uh, is one of the better ones. Uh, I, we haven't met, but I feel like I know you. Um, and that to me tells me everything about their comfort level with uh, working with us, which you know we, you know, we need to uh, consider uh, with uh, building those relationships. So. That is all. Uh, Questions. All right. Yes. I've got a few here. Um, first, folks who are just wanting to get a, sen a sense of scale, right? So you you uh, guys booked three and a half million of business. What is that as the as in a percentage of your current uh, um, annual sales? Um, annual sales. I believe we are in the uh, thirty million range right now. So that's about ten percent. So, okay, so you got a 10% improvement in sales with this investment. Great, awesome. And how many employees do you have? Uh, overall, as a company, we have just over 100, I believe. And before this, were you doing anything about um, web traffic like Google AdWords or other ways of generating traffic? No, literally no other ways of generating traffic other than uh, prior to that marketing initiative in late 2017 with the new website, some content in the social media. Yeah, the question was just uh, how how much would it have cost to get that kind of traffic with Google AdWords, which is a great question. For that is a great question. And I did dab. OK, so I did dab a little bit in pay per click for about five to six months. Um, we didn't throw a whole lot of money at, at it, but if you consider the keyword searches uh, for some of these, the volumes are, are kind of low. Uh, so I think the, the biggest keyword search uh, that I'd found was like 1900 per month. And so to be able to generate that much in pay-per-click, I think you would need to throw a lot of money at it um, just to get the volume. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't have a great answer for that. All I know is that the in the little, much, little bit that we've spent, uh, in the pay-per-click uh, realm, um, it didn't really uh, do a whole lot. It didn't didn't generate a lot. I think that uh, looking at the examples of the education that you provide, you would be hoping that someone would actually know to look for a reaction injection molding or long fiber reinforced something. Sure. Yeah. If you didn't know that existed, it'd be yes. a research won't help you because you can't say. But bigger, uh, have, uh, stronger, lighter, you know, that's yes. That's yeah. So uh, very good point, actually. And so we uh, actually make it a point to uh, have content on our website that speaks to those competitive materials. One of them uh, is called sheet molding compound. It's called uh, uh, SMC for short. And so we speak to that competitive material on our website. And in fact, if you Google sheet molding compound, I, I believe we're in the top five of that search we don't process sheet molding compound. So that is our way of being able to pull customers into a conversation that they normally wouldn't necessarily be in or would even know to search for. So uh, I'm sorry, we're gonna run over, but we're gonna have a couple more questions. And I appreciate y'all hanging with us, like most of you have. Um, one more question is, um, so in this environment where of course nobody can visit anyone, right? 
um, trade shows went away and tour plant tours. Um, what was the what was the track record on people watching the plant tour videos? How did that work out? And did that? You did um, I don't recall the actual numbers that they, they exist on YouTube. I'm sure I can I can probably look at them, but um, but in terms of um, numbers, I mean, uh, the engagement on LinkedIn is where, uh, like I said, is where I post most of uh, that as a concentration in social media. But um, the, the engagement's always been really good. Um, I've I've gotten hundreds of views uh, on most videos, uh, in some cases, a th thousands of views, um, and the interaction's usually pretty good. Um, but I, uh, beyond that, I can't uh, speak to it without actually looking at the YouTube numbers. Has your sales force used the tour, the plant tour, as a way of um, helping, you know? Yes, and so a lot of times, uh, our sales managers will be in a conversation with someone already, and they supplement those conversations with, you know, a lot of the content that I create because, you know, obviously it's it's at their fingertips. They can use it and, you know, show that. And they and they do actually do that. Great, great. Okay, well, that's all our questions. Does anybody have any more questions they'd like to field? You can type it into the Q and A box. Carrie Peel said she loves your results. Cool. Thank, thank you. The waffle iron slide since she figures it out. She's not an engineer, so she got it. Yeah, perfect. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. This recording will be up on our website in about 24 hours. And uh, if you signed up for this and it was your, your email that you signed up with and you didn't borrow it, you'll get an email from us that tells you where the link is. So appreciate that. And if you'd like to catch up with Brian, um, just let, you can contact us or go to the Romeo Rim site where they have a contact us link and uh, check it out. Yeah, I'd welcome it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thanks everyone Thank for joining us. Thank you.